Okay, welcome back everyone to Grocket OG TV. This is the GMAT edition where we're going through the 12th edition of the official guide to the test by the makers of the test themselves. We'll be going through question by question, <clears throat> cover to cover, the entire book. And uh, right now we're finishing up the diagnostic test at the beginning. Those questions count too, and all of those also have explanations and things to talk about. Um, we are almost done with that, so we are going to be moving on to the quantitative section today. And, I mean, unless things go horribly wrong, or these last few problems are terribly complicated, we will be moving on after a few. So, when we left off, uh, the last question we did was number 47 on page 43. Now we are on, uh, still page 43, but now we are on question number 48. Oh, I'm Jim Jacobson, in case uh, you didn't remember that from other times having watched the show. Okay, so, uh, critics contend that the new missile is a weapon whose importance is largely symbolic, more a tool for manipulating people's perceptions than to fulfill a real military need. The first step with the sentence correction questions is to determine whether there's an error in the sentence as written. Uh, this one, we do have a mismatch. We, when we have the, the kind of correlative construction um, more x than y. Uh, x and y need to be parallel, uh, like so many things on the GMAT. So we do actually need to have whatever is in the, the place of x here needs to be in the same format as the thing that's going to be in y. The sentence as written has more tool for manipulating than to fulfill. So we have for manipulating to fill, which is a problem uh, because it's not parallel. Uh, there's actually, in terms of uh, how you express purpose on the GMAT, uh, there are certain verbs, of course, that will only work with um, two and only some that will work with four, but both of them can be used to express purpose, but uh, they need to be parallel. So you can either say, um, so with the word um, a tool, you can have a tool for blanking whatever it is. Uh, and you can also have a tool to blank, and in that case you use the infinitive. But these both need to be in the same format when you have something that is more x than y, more a tool for x than, than a tool for y. You don't need to repeat the word tool, That's that part is left clear in terms of parallelism. The two phrases are, are relatively close together anyway, so even if there were confusion you could go back and look, um, <clears throat> you don't need to repeat everything for maximum parallelism. You just have to repeat the elements that could differ. In this case, though, they shouldn't be differing on the preposition. We need both four or both two. Because we have four and two, choice A cannot be the right one. Um, okay, so choice B. Uh, we have four and four. Okay, so that's good. Uh, choice C has two in the first half, and then than that it fulfills. That can't be right because it's not parallel. Choice C has two manipulate, then and then than fulfilling. So it doesn't even have the uh, doesn't even have the uh, for fulfilling, you know, tool for fulfilling. It just says than fulfilling. So it doesn't even have its preposition. D totally bad. Um, and uh, choice E has two in the first part, and then for fulfilling in the second part. So if we had had an answer choice that actually had a 2 and then another 2, like this guy up here, that would have been a serious contender for the correct answer. And we would have had to compare it to choice B with its 4, 4, um, because they would have been parallel. In this particular case, though, we didn't have any answer choices that, any other than B, of course, that matched uh, the, the two halves correctly for parallelism. 
with the correlative construction more x than y. So choice B is the correct one. We can happily move on. And we're going to be turning the page, so give me a moment to erase this stuff. All right. So uh, page 44, number 49. As an actress, and more importantly as a teacher of acting, Stella Adler was one of the most influential artists in the American theater, who trained several generations of actors, including Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro. First step, of course, look for the mistakes, if any. Um, one of the big ones, of course, uh, is we have this phrase, who trained several generations of actors, including Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro. Um, with the way that phrase is constructed, the, 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 the final, including Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro, that is basically renaming or specifying two generations of actors. Because, you know, the, the sentence as written says she trained several generations, including, so two of which, two of these generations were Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro. Which, of course, is not what the sentence really ought to be saying. It, it, it could be something along the lines of she trained several um, generations of actors and two of those actors were Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro. It could be expressed other ways as well, but we can't rename um, generations as actors. So uh, this one goes generations to actors. It's also a little bit suspicious having the relative clause who trained se several generations of actors, having that um, as far as it is from Stella Adler. It is a, um, a relative clause who can only refer to people, but in general you want to have them as close as possible to the thing that they're replacing, relative clauses that is. So, um, you know, ideally we would have that notion or that phrase closer to where she is in the sentence. Anyway, it's not choice A. And then we also have the problem with who in that one. So choice B. Um, uh, Stella Adler, one of the most influential artists in the American theater, trained several generations of actors who include. Um, so this is better because the generations include um, these these particular actors. Um, however, in this particular case, uh, those act those generations. I mean, uh, Marlon Brando is dead, uh, and those generations are past tense. So uh, it probably should be included rather than include because the training and the generations are over in the case of Marlon Brando. So, um, so that one's got include instead of included. Um, we can also, well, we'll just keep going through these in order. Um, choice C, Stella Adler was one of the most influential artists in the American theater, training several generations of actors whose ranks included. Okay, so whose can be used of more than just uh, people. It can also be used of things. Um, in this particular instance, then, we've kind of gotten rid of the idea of who trained and using the, the phrase comma training. And so when you have, um, you know, blah, 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 something, and you have an ing word, uh, normally this, this modification here... Um, Normally when you see this on the GMAT, the ING phrase, this guy here, and then there's going to be more words here, um, this is going to modify everything that came before it. Uh, so imagine that this is a longer phrase here, and imagine that that's a bracket. Um, yeah, so this one, uh, so this is the normal way on the GMAT that you're going to modify entire phrases before. So um, instead of just modifying the word that came directly before. So this is as opposed to blah, 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 comma, which, or da, 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 da comma, who. Now, uh, it is true, in real English, both of these guys uh, can refer back, you know, all the way to the whole, to the whole clause here. Um, 
but the more common thing grammatically with these relative clauses is for them to refer immediately back to the word right before. So um, for clarity's sake, the GMAT prefers the when you want to refer to everything that came before or something that referred to, to something further back, they want you to use the ING form. When you are using these relative clauses, you need to double check that it refers back to the thing right before. We did actually have a problem, I think even yesterday, where there was a who, um, although in that case it was without the comma. So when the comma is uh, a marker that indicates you've entered another level of the sentence, some other register of meaning. So without the uh, comma, it's very rare to see which without the comma, but it can happen, and then in which case it works the same way as that does. It's restrictive. But anyway, who without the comma uh, can refer to something more, uh, more directly to something in its same clause. Anyway, that's probably more detail than we need on this one. Um, choice C, uh, the point was, has the phrase training in it referring to the whole whole thing, including Stella Adler, which is what we needed it to do. So ch choice C, as it is, um, fixes one of the big problems that we had, which was with, which was with who in choice A. Choice D, um, so the opening phrase, of course, is as an actress, and more importantly, as a teacher of acting. Opening modifying phrases on the GMAT always need to have the thing that they're modifying be the first thing after the comma. In this particular case, after the third comma, because the phrase more importantly is just uh, kind of a par parenthetical uh, aside. So really, as an actress and as a teacher of acting, the thing right after that phrase needs to be Stella Adler. So choices D and E both start with one of the um, most influential artists. which makes it wrong just on that basis. Um, and uh, then choice D also repeats the who trained, although it does have who next to St Stella Adler, so I guess I don't really need to mark it as wrong. But um, And then the other, uh, the other one, of course, is that uh, choice D does have the including And remember, that's a problem because we have the generations of actors, including Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro. We need whose ranks include actors like that. So choices D and E both have problems, leaving us with choice C as the correct answer. Moving on. Still page 44. I guess all the rest of these will be on page 44. The last page of the diagnostic exam. So, question number 50. So by developing the Secure Digital Music Initiative, the Recording Industry Associations of North America, Japan, and Europe hope to create a standardized way of distributing songs and full-length recordings on the internet that will protect copyright holders and foil the many audio pirates who copy and distribute digital music illegally. First step, look for errors. Um, <clears throat> the errors that we might want to look for here, um, so we have a standardized way, and then we have a preposition. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the correct preposition after the word way? And we can see um, among the answer choices, we have two that are of. The first word is of. So we have way of. We have a four. And we have two that have two. So there's two this way, one that way, and two that way. Um, and in different cases, each of these prepositions can be correct. Um, I think in this particular sentence construction, I don't think we could have a correct sentence that uses for. So you can say there's no way for him to get to, um, you know, California um, in that car or something like that. Um, so that that one uh, you can use for with way, um, but. I think you would use it uh, in a separate instance for there's no uh, way of doing something, 
so way of doing, where, whereas for you would use with a, a pronoun, no way for her, no way for him. So this one would be plus a pronoun or a pronoun phrase. And really, ultimately, uh, in, a, in a something with no way for him, we are expecting no way for him to do something anyway. So really, we don't want for in this case. So we can get rid of choice C on the basis of the first word, which is lucky. So then we have a way of doing something and a way to do something. Both of those are grammatically correct, so that alone isn't going to enable us to eliminate any wrong answer choices. But that's the sort of thing we need to look out for. Let's see, what else do we need to worry about? Um, we have some parallelism. We have um, two verbs, two pairs of verbs, actually. So we have a way um, that will protect copyright holders and foil audio pirates. So that's one pair. Protect and foil. Then we have a second pair of, of describing what audio pirates do who copy and distribute. Okay, so these look okay to me in the answer as written, but let's see what the other answer choices do. Uh, choice B has a way um, uh, so we have a way to protect. Well, of course, here um, here in choice B, what we run into is something different. We have they hope to create a standardized way of distributing and to protect. So instead of um, a way that will protect and foil, um, choice B has it's a way of distributing songs and then they also hope to protect and foiling. Well, so we've changed uh, the form of the verb uh, three, or changed it twice, three different forms of what the sentence is trying to do in choice B. So um, to protect and then foiling not parallel and therefore not correct. Choice D, um, we have the initial four, four distributing songs and full length recordings, that's fine, while it protects uh, copyright holders um, and foils the many audio pirates. Um, well, that's okay, but the word while really kind of changes the meaning here. Um, so they want this uh, standardized way for distributing songs um, while it protects and and foils, um, I'm not so sure. I I I I don't um, I don't think they actually mean for it to do it only at the same time. They don't. I mean, while the, they do mean for both things to happen, but they don't mean for one to only be going on during the other. They want the way to be an absolute protection whether people are downloading things or not. I realize it's kind of a fine distinction, but the word while in here is definitely uh, strange. And right. So, I mean, that's I think that's going to be the biggest uh, problem. Also, it um, while well, it protects, yeah, I mean, it could refer back to um, the standardized way or the secure digital mi uh, music initiative, um, but the while really does kind of change the meaning of the sentence. I'm going to cross it off. Oh, sorry. While is still in choice C. Sorry about that. Actually, I can do That. All right. On to choice D. So we have a way to distribute songs um, while they will protect. So they, in this case, is clearly wrong. Um, if nothing else, it's this way, which is a singular form, or the Secure Digital Music Initiative, which is also singular. So we can't have a they in choice D. They just ruined they ruin everything. Um, choice E, uh, a way to distribute songs and it will protect. So again, we needed parallelism. Uh, we needed a way to and to protect. So it will is a problem there. So choice A, um, basically everything in it was parallel in the way that we expected it to be. Uh, also note that um, 
they did change a couple instances of the of, of our other pair there, copy and distribute. So we had foil the many audio pirates copying and distributing versus the many audio pirates who copy and distribute. Um, grammatically, they're both correct. So that's that's a false split uh, where one is not necessarily worse than the other. Um, you could argue the GMAT doesn't like its ING words. On the other hand, the ING words in this case use fewer words than um, pirates who copy and distribute. So um, in this case, though, they're both grammatically correct. So that would not have been a basis for eliminating choices D and E. Anyway, choice A, as written, correct parallelism, um, correct forms, correct idiom with our word way. Um, it's got everything we would need, except its smiley face. And now it's got that too. So choice A is the correct one. Uh, number 51. So whereas a ramjet generally cannot achieve high speeds without the initial assistance of a rocket, high speeds can be attained by scramjets, or supersonic combustion ramjets, in that they reduce airflow compression at the entrance of the engine and letting air pass through at supersonic speeds. Okay, so we have um, several issues of parallelism. We're comparing two things, whereas x, um, comma, y. So let's get that on the board here. Whereas x, y. And uh, like every other comparison on the GMAT, remember parallelism, GMAT loves parallelism so much the two of them should get married. Um, these two things, x and y, need to be the same things. So in this particular case, we're talking about ramjets in the non underlined portion. And in the underlined portion, the basis of the comparison needs to be to scramjets. So ramjets versus scramjets in a cage match to the death, um, or at least in a sentence where they're being compared. So here we actually need the underlined portion to begin with scramjets. Um, well, we'll just cover that issue first. Uh, choice A has high speeds in the comparison. And while we are talking about the speeds of the two of them, um, or their propulsion mechanism, uh, we need the comparison to be grammatically parallel. So high speeds doesn't work for A. Uh, that high speeds in B. Still wrong. Choice C has the ability. <laughs> Still not talking about our buddy the scramjet. Can't be that. Choices D and E both begin with the word scramjets, so we're comfortable there. Another issue with the sentence as written um, is uh, is basically in this this phrase at the end. So um, that's the idea here is that high speeds can be attained by scramjets, and then we rename what scramjets are: supersonic com combustion ramjets, basically SC ramjets, become scramjets. Clever acronym. Um, Scramjets in can be attained by scramjets in that they reduce. Um, that's clearly wordy as written. Um, so in choice A, this um, in that they so in that they reduce is clearly way more words than we're ever going to need on the GMAT. So we need another way of expressing this um, the means by which. Um, they attain higher speeds. And of course that very phrase, um, that means by which, by is the normal means of expressing agency or means. Just the word by. Um, it's a B. Uh, by is enough uh, to, to explain uh, the means by which, I can't even express means without using the word by. So, I mean, it doesn't mean it's impossible. I just can't think of a way off the top of my head. So we need the word by or something good and short, shorter that in that they reduce in our correct answer. So choice D has uh, scramjets, or then we rename it. Um, scramjets have the ability of attaining high speeds when reducing uh, the compression or airflow compression at the entrance. Okay, so this has multiple problems. Have the ability of reducing.
how about are able um you know really have the ability um hmm so it's not impossible that you could ever see uh have the ability correct on the gmat um if it were, it would be in the non-underlined portion, I suspect, or uh, the, the other answer choices would have things that are so wrong with them uh, that it must be the only correct answer. In general, though, um, have the ability is definitely more wordy than just saying are able, uh, because whatever is following have the ability would be, you know, have the ability to blah, blah, blah. You could just say are able to, and it means exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, so have the ability, terrible on the GMAT. Uh, run away from it double check to make sure that you know your right answer is in fact right but highly unlikely to be correct it really only leaves us with choice e but let's read it back in so whereas a ramjet generally cannot achieve high speeds without the initial assistance of a rocket scramjets or supersonic combustion ramjets can attain high speeds by reducing airflow compression at the entrance of the engine and letting air pass through at supersonic speeds. So here, instead of saying are able, we said can attain. It's still only two words. So can attain is fine. Um, and, um, and actually, in this particular case, are able to, uh, we still would have needed another verb, are able to reach. So can attain um, shortens that even more than the thing I came up with when I was telling you why D was wrong, um, and attain high speeds by reducing. So there's our buddy by to explain means, and yeah, basically choice E is totally awesome and tells us about scramjets, something we may not have known about before. Okay, choice E is correct, gets a box, and we move on. <clears throat> on to the last question in the diagnostic exam. I think I hope we get a good score on this one. I'm joking. I've gotten all of them right because I know the answers anyway. I looked them up. Anyway, um, in this particular case, then, we are on to question 52. It will, be not, it will not be possible to implicate melting sea ice in the coastal flooding that many global warming models have projected. Just like a glass of water that will not overflow due to melting ice cubes, so melting sea ice does not increase oceanic volume. So our idiom here is just as x, so y. And with so many of these idioms where we have, you know, these uh, correlative constructions here, uh, where the things are correlating to items, those two items need to be parallel. So we're comparing um, uh, well, in the non-underlined portion, the so portion of our comparison, it's sea melting sea ice. So whatever it is has to be compare compared and comparable to sea ice. What is the first thing? What is being compared in these different sentences? Uh, choice A, is comparing a um, a glass of water. Whoops, that's oh, that's going to be terrible. Sorry, I accidentally increased the size of my brush. Not at all what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay, so the first one is comparing the glass of water. To sea ice, when in fact we need to be comparing the ice in the glass of water to sea ice. Choice A can't be it. Um, choice B, we have like melting ice cubes. Okay, well that's got potential. Uh, choice C has a glass of water. <coughs> Again, being compared to sea ice. Choice D has melting ice cubes, which is good, and choice E has melting ice cubes. So we're able to get rid of two of the answer choices. That's typical of the GMAT, but that's still really good. If we knew nothing else about the sentence, and we do, but if we didn't, uh, we still have our odds of guessing down to one in three on this one, and then we could guess, move on, and get more points right on the GMAT. 
So let's take a look at choice B to see what else we have going on. So like melting ice cubes that do not cause a glass of water to overflow, um, so melting sea ice does not increase oceanic volume. Um, melting ice cubes that do not cause a glass of water to overflow. Let's talk about which versus that briefly. Um, So, um, in, in, if this isn't familiar with you, to, familiar to you, um, that is restrictive. When you use the word that, you are specifying particular ones as differentiated from other ones. You are restricting the thing that you are talking about to one particular subset. So, um, implying that there are others that are not like that. So in choice B, when we say like melting ice cubes that do not cause a glass of water to overflow, we are implying that there are other melting ice cubes that do cause a glass of water to overflow. We're restricting particular melting ice cubes. Um, we're saying that the melting sea ice is like these particular melting ice cubes that don't um, cause water glasses to overflow as differentiated from the ones that do. You know, I want uh, the dog that wags its tail the most um, differentiates it from all the other dogs that wag their tail less or tails less. So um, whereas which is not restrictive. Things that are um, and so the, when you use an expression with that, um, the information contained in the that phrase is necessary to identify which one you're talking about, which one or ones. With a phrase like which, it's non-restrictive and can be deleted from the sentence. You do lose some information, but it's not information that's key to understanding the sense of the sentence. The other thing, of course, is that uh, which, because it's this whole separate par parenthetical phrase, you will almost always see a comma before which and never see it before that. Um, at least when it's a restrictive clause. If it's the other kind of that, he decided that he would go to the store, that he would buy some candy, you could repeat that in that context. Uh, it's not necessary for parallel parallelism, but you could, and then that would be an instance where you would see comma that. Okay, anyway, back to this. Uh, choice B, like melting ice cubes that do not cause a glass of water to overflow, incorrectly differentiates these ice cubes from other ones. Um, it is in fact the case that because uh, ice takes up more volume than the water it replaces, when it melts, the volume of water actually decreases. Um, so there are no melting ice cubes that would cause a glass of water to overflow. Okay, so now we're down to D and E, and here we have as. Like versus as is a, maybe more than I really need to get into on this one. Um, we'll get another chance to see it later in the official guide. Um, just know that like can't join an entire clause, something that has a verb in it. As is a conjunction, so as can. and uh, both D and E correctly use use them, um, and actually like is used correctly in choices A and B. So, I mean, the errors are don't come from the word like. So anyway, I think we'll leave like versus as out of this one. So then we have uh, choice D, as melting ice cubes that do not cause a glass of water to overflow. Here again, we have that restrictive that, these these magical ice cubes that, you know, no money can buy these rare ice cubes that do not cause, and of course I'm joking, any ice cubes have this effect. There are no, there is no subset of ice cubes that don't do this. I'm sorry for beating this point to death. Anyway, choice D has the that problem, and in that it restricts these ice cubes unnecessarily. Uh, choice E is the only one we're left with. Let's read it back in to make sure it's right. It will not be possible to implicate melting sea ice in the coastal flooding that many global warming models have projected. Just as melting ice cubes do not cause a glass of water to overflow, so melting sea ice does not increase oceanic volume. So we're comparing ice cubes to melting sea ice. In fact, yeah, melting ice cubes to melting sea ice, super parallel. Um, the, the conjunction as, we do have a verb in the clause, do not, do not cause. So, uh, that's a correct use of as, and um, yeah, everything else is clear, concise, and grammatically correct. Choice E is the best, and in fact the correct answer. Okay, uh, this concludes the 
diagnostic test portion of the official guide. Um, I don't really feel comfortable ending right here. Uh, we're only about halfway through the uh, the show, so I'm going to head go ahead and start the quantitative section, which is much further in after all the explanations for the questions we've just been going through. Okay, so fast forward to section 5.3, page 152, question number one. So a project scheduled to be carried out over a single fiscal year has a budget of $12,600 divided into 12 equal monthly allocations. At the end of the fourth month of that fiscal year, the total amount actually spent on the project was $4,580. By how much was the project over its budget? So in this particular case, we need to figure out first what the budget was for that four-month period, um, and then um, figure out the difference between um, that amount and the amount actually spent. Since we know that it's over budget, we know we'll be subtracting the amount of the budget from $4,580. So we're given the uh, fiscal year budget of uh, $12,600. So to figure out the value, uh, the monthly budget for that, we would divide it by 12. Uh, 12,600 divided by 12 ends up being 1,050 shortcut if it matters is you can di divide 12,000 by 12 and divide 600 by 12 if that makes the math any easier for you um, and it ends up being 1,050 so that's one month so uh, and you'll note of course that choice C has 1,050 as the answer so if you kind of forgot what you were doing and said oh it's 1,050 I have the right answer well there's your trap right there choice C um, we need to figure out next what the budget for the four months is. So four, t four times uh, 4,050 is uh, times four equals um, 4,200. Um, luckily that answer does not appear as a trap. Now we just need to subtract the two. So we have our original actual spent versus the 4,200 and we end up with $380, and that is choice A. Um, do also note that choice D with the 1380 is there. Perhaps if you, um, it, I guess maybe they're expecting somebody to do the math wrong, um, maybe somehow coming up with 3200 uh, for the four the uh, the budget for the four months anyway so this is another trap answer there because it's got the uh, the, the right last three digits but we, we were not fooled it is choice a all right question number two So if the sum of 5, 8, 12, and 15 is equal to the sum of 3, 4, x, and x plus 3, what is the value of x? An invaluable GMAT skill is converting words from both problem solving and data sufficiency questions, converting words into math. Uh, sum is the word for an addition problem. So um, if the, the sum, the adding together 5, 8, 12, and 15 is equal to adding together 3, 4, x, and x plus 3, what is the value of x? We can just write it down. So we have the sum of 5 plus 8 plus 12 plus 15 equals the sum of 3 and 4 and x and x plus 3. Uh, 8 and 12 is 20. 
5 and 15 is 20. Whenever, whenever you can, do some of the math the easy way. Uh, if you see easy numbers to match up to make the math even easier. Well, it's easier for me. Maybe for you, it's easier to just do, you know, 5 plus 8 is 13. Plus, you know, whatever. Whatever works for you, you should do. I like to break things down into even groups of 10 when I can, and especially when it's obvious. So in this case, <clears throat> we end up with 40 on this side. And then we have 7 um, plus, well, really, 2x plus 3. Because again, the commutative property of addition, you know, x plus x plus three is this, you know, can add it all together. Forty equals two x plus ten. Two x equals thirty. So x equals fifteen. Which is choice B. I probably should have written the other answers in. Okay. Um, and no particular traps on this one. Just. Um, some arithmetic where if you get it a little bit wrong, you'll end up with the wrong answer. I'm not sure exactly how they expect you to come up with these other answers, but maybe they just had to come up with something so that if people were guessing, they would have something else to pick. Choice B, 15, is absolutely correct. Uh, question number three on page 152. All right, so we have, and the answers then are one, two, three, four, and five. So which of the following, for which of the following values of n is 100 plus n quantity divided by n not an integer? So we have our um, 100 plus n divided by n. When is that not an integer? We can just plug these answers in and see which ones come out right. Um, so for the first one, this would be 101 divided by 1. Well, any number, any integer divided by 1 stays an integer. So this one is still an integer. Uh, 102 divided by 2. Any even number divided by uh, 2 is going to remain an integer also. Um, in this case, it equals you know, 51, but uh, still an integer. Uh, 103 divided by 3. So one of the easy tests to determine whether a number is divisible by 3 is to add up all the digits. If those digits add up to a number divisible by 3, then the whole number is divisible by 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 is not divisible by 3. Um, so eh, um, let's check the other ones. 104 divisible by 4. Well, it turns out it is. That, that actually equals 26. So that one's an integer. And then 105 divisible by 5. Um, it is useful to learn the rules for recognizing whether words are divisible by other numbers. 105, any number that ends in a zero, that's one that units the units digit. If it ends in a zero um, or a five, um, it's divisible by five. Yeah, I mean minus zero itself. So any number, any multiple of five is going to either end in five or zero. So anyway, uh, that one equals 21. Also an integer. So choice C, three is the only one that does not result in an, in, in an integer when we plug it into 100 plus n divided by n. Uh, question number four. On page, still page 152. And we have 13 and a half, 18, 18 and three quarters, 21, 24. Okay. So rectangular floors X and Y have equal area. If floor X is 12 feet by 18 feet and floor Y is 9 feet wide, what is the length of floor Y in feet? 
Um, we don't actually need a diagram for this one, but I'm going to draw one anyway. So we have floor X and floor Y. And floor X is 12 by 18. We know that the width of floor Y is 9, and we're trying to find this value right here. Um, and we know that their areas are equal. So remember that the area of a rectangle is um, area of a rectangle equals uh, length times width. So that means in this case that 12 times 18 equals 9 times whatever our value is. Let's just call it W because it's uh, or L because it's the length of the uh, of rectangle Y that we don't know. Um, you could, if you wanted to, multiply 12 times 18 and then divide by 9. It's easier if you can, since this is basically um, that these are two factors of whatever the area of the both of these rectangles are, because uh, 12 and 18 are both factors, as is 9, as it turns out. Um, if you can divide any part of this by this, um, you've made your life easier. So it turns out 18 is divisible by 9. So if we divide both sides by 9, we end up with 12 times 2 equals L, because we divided 18 by 9. So that got us a 2. 12 times 2 is 24. L stays L. Correct answer is E, 24. On a roll. All right, question number 5. Last one on this page. Oh, let's get the answers in. They're all dollars. So we have 23,500, 23,750, 23,900, 24,125, and 24,250. When the numbers are more fine-grained like this, uh, you can tell just from the answer choices that you are almost certainly going to have to do some in, more in-depth math. So that's the way it goes. I mean, the GMAT wouldn't be the same if you didn't have to do any math, would it? So the table above shows the number of employees at each of four salary levels at Company X. What is the average salary for the 20 employees? Um, the important thing to note from the table is that there are different numbers of employees at the different salary grades. If they were not different, if there were the same number, regardless of what that number actually is, we could simply do an average of the four numbers um, of 20,000, 22,000, 25,000, and 30,000. We could just do the simple average of those. Um, however, they, there are different numbers of people at the different pay grades, so what we're going to be doing is actually a weighted average, uh, where we basically have to add up all of the individual numbers we're going to collapse things a little bit by doing some multiplication, but we have to add up all the salaries um, and weight it appropriately according to the number of people who are in each category. We do so by multiplication. So we have uh, five people at 20,000. So five times 20,000. We would be adding that to the four people at 22,000. To that, we would add the eight people at 25,000. I don't really want to work at this company. Um, and three people are making $30,000 per year. Maybe they have commissions on top of this. And so that is then by multiplying the number of people times uh, each salary level, this effectively is adding up 20,000 plus 20,000 plus 20,000 plus 22 plus 22 in the correct numbers all the way across, and we can still figure out the average. We divide the whole thing by 20, and then that will be the average salary. So 5 times 20,000 is 100,000. Uh, 4 times 22,000 is 88,000. 
8 times 25,000 is 200,000. And 3 times 30,000 is 90,000. We still have to divide the whole thing by 20. Okay, so we end up adding all these together. Um, you know, 200 plus 100 is 300,000. 90 plus 88 is 178. So the whole thing ends up being 478,000. Divided by 20. Um, simplify it however you like. Divide by 10, then divide by 2. Um, anyway, it ends up being 23,000. So, you know, again, the first thing you can always do is do that and then divide the whole thing by two. Um, and that's where you get 23,900, choice C. None of the other answer choices are obvious traps. They're just counting on some people in, in out there uh, doing the math incorrectly. One of these is, I didn't actually compute it, but one of these answer choices seems like it must be the... Um, the actual average of the salaries, because that that would be the most common miscalculation to make on this one would be to just average the salaries together without weighting it according to um, the number of people in each category. Anyway, moving on. And we're no longer going to be on page 152, so I've got to get rid of that. All right, page 153, question number six. And we have 100 BC, 100 B over C, 200 BC. B over C and then 200 over BC. Should have made my letters bigger. Anyway, okay. So a case contains C cartons. Each carton contains B boxes and each box contains 100 paper clips. How many paper clips are contained in two cases? And and so we know from the answer choices, which in real life you would you wouldn't have been able to look at the look at the question without it at least catching your eye. Um, when you see an answer, when you see a list of answer choices like this, you know that you're you're being called upon to convert a basically a story problem or you know some uh, a math problem spelled out in words, uh, being asked to convert it into an algebraic expression. So, um, and when we get to the story, of course, it turns out to be exactly that. So we need to make sure that our final answer represents the number of paper clips contained in two cases. Uh, it's easy, easiest in most cases to just write things down in the order that they give them to you. There will be times when you will have to do it in some other type of order, but um, when in doubt, just start with what they give you and adapt it as you go. So we know that a case contains C cartons. C, okay. Um, and we know that uh, each carton contains uh, B boxes. So a given case has, uh, e e e so each carton has B boxes, and a case has C cartons. So um, let's see, let's do this. Um, a case, C cartons. Uh, a case then still has, um, if we wanted to know how many boxes are in a case, that would be, since there's B boxes in every carton, um, the case would have B times C boxes, because there's B boxes in every carton, and so however many cartons there are, we would multiply that times the number of boxes. A case then, ha and each box has 100 paper clips, so a case would have um, 100 paper clips for every box and for every one of those, times the number of cartons. So each case has 100 BC paper clips. There's choice A right there, but it's a trap. No! 
because of course we were actually asked in the original question to, to answer how many paper clips are contained in two cases. Uh, so it actually, so two cases, I just multiply the whole thing times two, is 200 BC paper clips. Which is, ah, I drew it to the wrong thing. Oh no. Okay, there we go. Um, 200 BC paper clips, choice C is the correct answer. Um, I think I'll stop there for today. Um, yeah, in theory I could get through the next one, but I, I hate to rush it. I hate to end right, right on the moment since uh, there may be another show coming up. So um, anyway, very good. Uh, thanks for watching. This has been the Grocket uh, OGTV GMAT edition where we go through the entire official guide question by question. Uh, my name is Jim Jacobson. I I will be your, uh, thing, if, unless I'm sick or something, I will be your broadcaster for the next session. We will pick up with question seven on page 153. And um, 